All right, and I'm back. Uh, thanks for everyone who was uh, waiting briefly. Um, we're back on solving more problems. So where did we leave off? I left off, uh, just finished. Uh, bu -bu -bu -bu. B. All right, so let's work on C here. Plot all balanced state energy eigenfunctions for G not equals 0 0.1, G not equals 1 half, and G not equals 10. So, you to me here. Hey, you want to say hi to everyone on the stream here? I'm uh, cat sitting. This is a friend's cat. Hey, sniffing around. <laughs> um, Digging around in there. You lose your toy or something? Okay. Uh, <laughs> cat interruptions aside. Um, oh, you know what? I'm going to just take him out of here. This little cat likes plastic bags and he's making a bunch of noise right here. Okay, so we were doing it this here um, for G naught, and we want to do it for 0 0.1, 1 half, and 10. Uh, so I'm going to just do it on here because we already have this, but. Actually, maybe I'll just redraw it because we've got to have. So our functions are like this and like this, and they kind of converge here. And this is um, our, what, what was this? This was our dimensionless value of energy. And uh, for G naught equal to, so this is 2G naught. So for G naught equal to 1 half, that's right here. For 0.1, that would be like here. And then what's the other one? 10? So that's going to be way up here. Uh, I think that's about what we want. So let's see. I think that's the answer. Oh. Wait, what? Hey, Jail. Uh, from part we know that G naught is equal to point one gets an even bound state. I prefer studying at home. Cat, get out of here. Oh my god. <laughs> I've got a distracting little cat playing with the blinds here. There we go. Um, uh, gives a single even bound state. A second odd solution appears with zero energy. A zero current is not normalizable. Okay, well, this is basically what this one has single even. This is our uh, starting odd, and this is degenerate, which is kind of what came out of the last question. D. Plot all balanced state energy. Oh, no, that's. So we just did. 
How does the energy of the most tightly bound state vary as you vary L? Include a plot with axis and units label that shows energy as a function of L. Yikes. Okay. Um, So we want e not e, e zero as a function of l. And then here we want l. Well, we have to change over our units now. So. Before this was equal to KL, and K was equal to, oh, what was K equal to? Something over H bar squared, what was it? Oh, I've got it written up here. It is equal to, uh, or, oops. E is equal to H bar squared K squared minus e squared squared over 2m. So energy as a function of L is going to be, uh, what we need to solve for E, so this is going to be E naught. And that's going to be 2m E naught over h bar squared square root times L is equal to this. Which is equal to our cotangent function. So we need to convert this into something else. Um, E naught. Well, hold on a sec. I actually don't know that I need to do this. Um, hmm. When does this? L divided by R naught is our G naught here. So Eighty-nine, eighty-nine. Asked, do I think I'm actually getting an actual understanding of quantum physics? Well, I'm starting to. I think my challenge right now is a lot more with uh, demonstrating things than having a certain understanding. I usually have a general sense of why something would be true, but my math is a lot uh, worse for actually proving that. I mean, there's still gaps, so it's kind of a they kind of support each other. As you get better at the math, certain things become obvious, which weren't obvious before. And as you get better conceptual understanding, you get a better sense of how to approach things with the math.
Well, I do think that there's a, a certain amount that you need to calculate things. And so that things show up sort of non-obviously from calculations. But I wouldn't say that it's a shut up and calculate process. I mean, most of these problems, um, you should be able to have some kind of intuition of how they should look even without having to do all this math. So this one here, for instance, I'm drawing this crazy graph here. But basically, the idea we have behind this graph is that we're going to have um, we're going to have a bound state when these things are close together. We're going to have a single kind of bound state, and then there's going to be an odd bound state like this that's going to show up, but it's going to require more energy to show. Or sorry, it's going to require more separation to show up. And then when they're super far away, these are basically the same because they they have almost the same energy level. The Soundmaster asks, do you think a student who studies the course at university would have it harder than you, or do you think he wouldn't have an advantage over you? Um, it really depends. I think like, learning the material is still the same. I do feel like I'm at a little bit of a disadvantage in this course because I'm going to run out of feedback material. Um, so when I was doing the MIT challenge, I rarely had to use all the feedback material. So I don't think I was at a significant disadvantage. Here, I might be at a disadvantage just because an MIT student is going to do recitations. They're going to have more kind of opportunities for feedback. So if there's something I don't understand, I only have this material to work with, which for a class that you don't, you find kind of in the moderate level of difficulty, that might not be an issue. But if you find it super difficult, it might be quite hard because you may not have enough information to figure out what you're doing wrong. So I, I don't think I'm at that, that big of a disadvantage. Um, compared to an MIT student, but I definitely have to be uh, careful about how I do things. The fact that I have these problem sets puts me at a slight advantage, I would say, over an MIT student doing the same thing. But I mean, an MIT student also has access to open courseware too, so it's not, uh, it's not crazy different. My main advantage is that uh, I don't have to go to MIT and pay tuition and get it admitted and stuff to do this. So, all right, let's 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 go back to questions. Um, so I have to, how does the energy of the bound state vary with L? Hmm. Well, intuitively, intuitively, as L gets really small, the energy is going to be about twice as high, right? So in the limit that L goes to zero, these are just stacked on top of each other and you have two W naughts, so the energy, the lowest bound state is twice. Whereas if they're super far, you know, then they're, they're basically not contributing to each other. And you have um, just the, the single well case. Um, so that's the intuition here. But how do I get this graph over? Because we've got this god awful hyperbolic tan. And I've got to get it expressed over in this way. Uh, I don't have to do this analytically. Well, that's good. Hmm. I don't know whether I can solve this just doing the algebra. Because this is our uh, dimensionless energy. How does it vary with, how does E not vary with this? Well, it's going to be L E um, times, uh, we'll just put these squared, right? No, it can't be squared. It's dimensionless energy. I must have screwed something up. I can't be squaring this to get the E naught. Um, hmm.
Hmm, okay. Um, I'm feeling somewhat stuck on this here. Plot the induced force between, okay, so we're doing this one. Uh, how does the energy the most tightly bound state vary as you vary L? Oh, oh. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I'm just, this, this question here is just killing me, so I'm gonna go to the answer. From the plots, we can see as the wells brought close together, the value of E for the ground state decreases. Uh, we can see that the that the ground state becomes more tightly bound. We can numerically solve for E as a function of L, and then use equation four or not. Equation four to plot the ground state energy. So I, I don't have uh, Mathematica. I'm not quite sure how to do this algebraic thing that they're doing, which I mean is something that they're expected to know, which I don't. Um, but I'm going to just ignore that because it's not really what I was going after. Uh, so, so this is E and L. And... Uh, this is our plot, roughly. Okay, and then this one is suppose we place an article. Do the tel do delta uh, do the two delta functions want to be close together or far apart? Plot the induced force between the delta functions as a function of L. Ah, so if we have this potential. The potential varies via distance. This implies a force, I think. This implies a force. Milk, you're getting bored. Hey, you can help me do math problems, Milk. All right. This is my friend's cat. I'm cat sitting, and he's he won't leave me alone right now. All right. Um, <laughs> So what do we, can we get a force from this, um, this gradient here? Or this change in potential? <clears throat> How do we calculate that? So force is, Related. Oh, I should use this pencil. This is my work. Force. Force uh, is related to a uh, change in potential. So, what is the change? Hmm. Uh, well, is that going to be the second derivative of this? Um, thanks, Frank. Huh. Well, the for I don't know, the force is related to what? The second derivative of this? Second derivative, first derivative?
Yeah, I don't know. I feel like I should know this, but I don't know it. So, what do we have here? Going to lower L minimizes the energy. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, okay. So I have to figure out this is the, this is the change in energy. So uh, induced force is going to be ah uh, okay. F is equal to minus d d x e of x. It's equal to minus d e two l energy. Um, how do we get a two there? force yeah I, I know it looks like the root function I think it's a lot more complicated than that like they're asking us to do it num numerically so it's some um, looks like I think it's some awful kind of transcendental equation so that's why we're doing it numerically but uh, unless there's a closed form solution that we're not trying to solve right now because we're looking at it. We have this. We have this e ten, e e hyperbolic ten e plus e is equal to this g naught. So, um, so we're getting this awfulness right here. But the the force is going to be this. I, I just don't know how to get this. The one half ddl. E, where do we get the half? I guess because the, the well distance is 2L. I think that's why, so. All right. Oh. Um, suppose we place the, uh, that we did this one, yeah. Use the above to suggest a plausible explanation for why hydrogen is a stable molecule. Well, um, so this, there is, two, um, electron. two protons. This idea basically being that this, because this has um, like E0 is uh, smaller here. No, smaller. Um, uh, yeah, E0 is smaller. Here than far away. This this pulls them together. Because uh, an electron electron would fall into the sort of double well more easily. So this one makes them want to go together. So that makes hydrogen stable. Use the quantum bound state applet to explore the dependence of energies of the various bound states of a pair of identical wells as a function of the distance between the wells and the shape of the wells themselves. How does the splitting between the levels change as you increase the separation between the wells? Why does the second excited state have the same number of nodes inside each well as the third excited state, but not the same as the fourth? 
Uh, do I have this one? Do I have the balanced data applet? I maybe downloaded it. I think this is the one that we were looking at last time. Yeah, okay. So let's, um, let me open that up. You know, I'm just gonna go to here and, oh, let me get the, Hopefully this doesn't crash everything here. So we want to do blah, 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 two wells. So as we separate them, they basically just, hmm, can we plot? I'm not quite sure what I'm supposed to find from this. What does it say? How does the splitting between energy levels change as you increase the separation? Well, as you decrease the separation, the splitting increases. So that's one thing right there. Um, why does the second excited state have the same number of nodes inside each well as the third excited state, but not the same as the number as the fourth? So, This E1 is supposed to be E0, so the first excited state would be this one and this one, but they don't have the same amount of nodes. I don't understand. You know what? I'm going to just switch off this right now and go back to seeing what they recommend. If delta functions were real protons, the repulsive effect between the nuclei would dominate at really small L, and the net result would be the red curve. In that case, one sees that there exists an equilibrium at L. What? Um, oh, that's what they mean. Why it's stable is because it doesn't... It's not, doesn't become uh, infinitely high force. Okay, um, 3G, when two wells of say width L are very close together, we can consider them as only one well of width 2L. 
Whereas when they are far apart, the energy levels are approximately the same as those of a single well. We then expect that increasing the separation between the two wells, the energy levels move from the eigenvalues of the well of width 2L to the eigenvalues of the well of width L. Uh, da, da, da. For two separated wells, so the first two states are symmetric and anti-symmetric superpositions of the ground states of the individual wells. Second two states, which are the second and third excited states, are symmetric and anti-symmetric superpositions of the first excited states. And so we have the same number of nodes inside each well for the second and third excited state, but they differ from the number of nodes in the fourth because the symmetric superposition of the second because the anti-symmetric combination has an extra zero halfway between the two wells. Okay. All right, uh, I think I'm gonna leave that. Let's go on to the next question. Uh, this is six. I think this is the last question for this problem set. Hermitian operators and commutators, okay. Recall the Hermitian adjoint of an operator A hat is defined to be the operator A hat dagger such that for all functions F and G, uh, the inner product of F A dagger G is equal to A F and G. Show that F A dagger G is equal to G. All right. So we want to show uh, F. Uh, so we can just do a complex conjugation, right? It's equal to what? This is equal to, uh, right? Um, So we can just move it through. So we can just have a dagger G. Um, I don't believe the order should should matter here.
Uh, oh, okay. I think we should be able to separate this out, right? So yeah. Uh, I'm going to do F real X G real X. Imaginary X. But this is the complex conjugate, so this is just going to be an overall minus sign here. Hmm. Doesn't really look like it. Did I flip these around by mistake? And that is this, isn't it? Mm. Okay, let's try it a different way. Um, Expanded on both sides here. trying to prove. Um, hmm.
I don't know, Aaron, I don't mind. Um, real f star of x. Um, how are you going to get this? Complex conjugate of this dot product. Inner product. This, uh, this, and then what do we have? Um, this, 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 this is minus, binary, oh, minus, real f of x, a hat, imaginary, Okay, and then we have Thanks. 
Oh no, imaginary. Imaginary G of X. Uh, so. And then we've got this just becomes what we wanted, which is fx a hat gx. So I have to show that this disappears. And um, Am I doing this definition right? I think so. Yeah, I think so. Um, and this would be move it over to A, so we have uh, imaginary G of X A real F of X. Right. How do I show that that goes to zero? Uh, I'm looking here, but I'm just confirm the uh, inner product. I just didn't cancel in any trivial way. Uh, what else could I do? Hmm.
Yeah, I don't know how to get that over. All right, let's look at the answers. Uh, note the following useful property. How does that happen? Well, all right, I mean, good to know, I guess. How do you show that? Let's see if we can show that. So, <clears throat> oh, running low on income, this guy here. Do I have another one? Um, give me one second, I'm just gonna grab another pen. Oh, oh, right, of course. Of course, uh, FG equals F star G it doesn't equal F times G. All right. Oh, that's, yeah, that's my bad. Okay. All right. Let's try this one now. Uh, B, um, show that. Okay, so
Oops. Oh, so what do we have? We have um What is it? It's F is This is equal to you show this is equal to uh, Really? Hmm. This doesn't seem to be right. What was the definition of the adjoint? Go back to that.
What is the definition of the adjunct? Clearly not equal to itself, it's equal to minus to itself. So how do I get I mean let's try this uh, using this part from A. So F Dagger G is equal to G A F. And this is equal to uh, F. F I H bar dagger G dagger H bar. F Oh, that's proof makes any sense. I just put that in there. I can put anything in there. Hmm. How can you show? Okay. Ah. 
Oh, okay. So then this is equal to See. Okay. Uh, let's go back to our definition here. Let It's not an yes. This one I should get.
Okay. Uh, D, so this one was correct. D. Show that, oh. So we have uh, F. We just did this one. A B becomes becomes um. All right. Oh, but they're equal to their own, right? They're equal to their own adjoint because they're hermeticity. So uh, then we just get.
Okay, that should show that. Okay. E. Show that the eigenvalues of Hermitian operators A and B are all real. Hmm. Let's go with the definition a, a equal to a. So I'll just I'll put it on some some phi. A phi equals a phi. Uh, and how do we show that? So that's a real number. Um, hmm. So definition again, we have F star so because these are Hermitian, we can just drop the dagger. A, G. So, A F G V X. So we don't really need that there. Um yeah. So we know that. And then uh uh this would give little eigenvalue a we have a g equal to a g this only works if a is equal to cobbler's conjugate which uh, only true for is an element of the reals. I think that's true. Okay. F Show that C hat, C hat. So we have again, um, let's use phi here, phi star. This is going to give us my I star C.
Yeah, it's the same argument, basically. Uh, G. Suppose... J minus S J K Hermitian uh, I is Hermitian uh, no can't be Hermitian because that's not imaginary. Show that, okay. Uh... I have to show hmm. I suppose that's not true because this is just the eigenvalues. Of that operator, so it's not necessarily the case that that's true. So let's actually show it. Um, let me do this on a new page. So we have K hat J hat and for it to be Hermitian, let's say the J is equal to Hmm. 
What do we have here? We have uh, F. <clears throat> Hmm. How do I solve this? <sighs> okay, well, we can ask this by taking this commutator um, relationship. So we have Let's go again. Yeah, I'll just write it as F star. Of let's go K hat J hat minus. And then just do one like this. Yeah. I'll oh, kind of like this. So these are all equal to. I don't need to do all this. What am I doing? I can just go and just use the outcome of this here. S F star. No, no, that doesn't work. Um, let me just rewrite this here. We've got K, J, F, minus J, K, F. Uh, same idea, these are going to get changed over, so we're going to have S star uh, G dagger, K dagger, G. Minus K, J. that and this is equivalent to f star of k dagger k dagger g is not g t 
Terrier King Terrier. Yeah. Uh, to minus Hmm. Where am I getting stuck? I don't think this is the right way to go about it. Um, hmm. Is J Hermitian? Well, if J were Hermitian, the commutator would be anti Hermitian. So if we can show that the commutator is not anti Hermitian, then we've shown that J is not anti Hermitian. So we know K is this, and we know, so suppose, suppose J is Hermitian, and this is true. Uh, it just means that that's true. That doesn't really mean anything, though. Uh, we have to use this fact. So this is so I say yes. Yeah. Yes. J is Hermitian because that. Hmm, okay. Um So by the same logic, we just had right, the 
this is Huh. Am I missing a minus sign here? What do we have here? Oh, no, no, no. This is equal to minus SJ complex conjugate. If S is real, it's just S. Ooh, let me try this again. So what do we know? We know K and J. We want to know if it's Hermitian. If it were Hermitian, then F Minus will be equal to would be anti hermitian but we know this is minus complex conjugate of minus s j hat g and then we get it all the way down to this and we have F star J dagger Which if we take a minus sign over here, so let's just plop a minus sign here and flip these around. Okay, dagger. And this is, we can relate these two here. So I would say yes, it is. Hermitian. Let's see if we got that right. Not Hermitian. Jeez. Oh my God. Wow. Okay. Let me write down what they got. Because I clearly got the wrong answer here. She's not Hermitian, which is something that was mostly easily proven by contradictions. Suppose we were to assume that J were Hermitian so that J R is equal to J. Right. Should we write J as
Wow, okay. That was wrong. Let's try another one. To show that... So I'm going to show... Okay. Hunt J hunt equal to plus S J hunt dagger. Hunt dagger. Now join. Um, hmm. Well, we can use this analysis here to show that Calvin. Because of this, this is equal to that. And so we get this. Times by S and so sign we get K J dagger is equal to K J dagger. Same thing. Okay. Uh, now three. Suppose Okay. Show that it is an eye function of K with K S S. Show Okay, um, hmm. well, this is obviously related to the raising and lowering operator, but how do we make this work? Um, well, if we have, let me check next this one, if we have, uh, We have this commutator relation. We know that uh, minus S J J minus J K hmm. hmm. Thank you. 
basically we want to show that k applied to j psi k is equal to k minus s. So we need to show Right. So we have kj sine k. This is j. Oh, sorry. Well, we know by the eigenfunction that this is equal to this. We have kj, k. Mm. I don't know that that works, though. So we need to commute it through. And how do we do that? So we have kj psi k is equal to jk psi k minus sj psi k. We have kj. Uh, this just works to the commutator of k and j is equal to sj. Which we already knew. So that should be the case. And then 1b, show that is an eigenfunction. So we need to do the other thing around now. Um, uh, so we have Okay, right, that's not what we did. Like that, that's what we showed. So, we can just ditch these things. We can just go uh, K, J, dagger. J dagger. Dagger is equal to plus S J. Oops, S J. Yeah. 
switch if we get rid of those. I think, did we show that one already? We showed that one already. Yeah, so which already shown. And what's the last one? V. In the harmonic oscillator, what plays play the role of this, this, and this? K is obviously E. J is obviously A. And J dagger is A dagger. All right. Okay. All right, I think that's the end of this problem set. Why Hermitian? Okay, this is good to read this right now. We've taken it as a postulate that observables in quantum mechanics are represented by Hermitian operators with the observable values uh, determined by the spectrum of eigenvalues of the operator. We've justified the restriction to Hermitian operators by requiring all observables to be real. However, it is easy to construct matrices which have all real eigenvalues, which are not real, for example, because they're in the matrix. M's eigenvalues are both real, but M is explicitly not Hermitian. If I tell you that a sample system observed to have n plus minus a cool value. Okay, I mean, this makes sense. I probably need to work a little bit more to understand these uh, operators, but um, let's go to number seven. Oh, I got another hour left. Mathematical preliminaries, facts about unitary operators. An operate, a unitary operator U is an operator whose adjoint is its inverse, i.e. U dot U. Okay. Show that all eigenvalues of a unitary operator are pure phases. Okay, so U... Did we have a definition of the adjoint somewhere? Where was the definition of the adjoint? Because I feel like that we, we did the Hermitian adjoint here, but I don't know whether we have, do we have notes on adjoints themselves?
So an adjoint is just such that um, So this is the adjoint Hermitian equals this unitary is Okay, so these are our definitions we're working with. So this is just what the adjoint is. All right. Show that all eigenvalues of a unitary operator are pure faces. So if we were to go u, phi equals lambda phi, so that's an eigenvalue. How do I get the how do I get the adjoint in there? I mean we can just do That would be trivially true, right? And that would also be true that this this would be true, right? I didn't do anything helpful. Mm. Okay, maybe we have to do it from this sort of understanding of let's remember what our thing is. So F <laughs> what am I missing here? And just by definition, the 
like we have to add in maybe from the last prompt set. So if we're doing a I don't think this gets me anything. I need to use this phi somewhere. Um, where would I start? Well, Hmm. Anything I think. We don't know what that is like, so that is necessarily doing. Um, but we know that you know this is gonna be psi times psi dagger has to equal one, right? Otherwise this whole unitarity thing wouldn't work. Gonna use this complex conjugation thing. That's how we're gonna get it out. Okay. So crap, how do I do this? Um so I know that this is gonna be one. So let's take it with um our But 
we know this. Uh, is just, I'll call this lambda dagger psi is equal to lambda star psi conjugate this. So we know lambda dagger has to be equal to lambda star. Um, and only way this be true. We have to show we have to show lambda star lambda. This is the only way that this is true. I guess that's the way I'm going to show it. Let's see what they have here. Uh, Okay. All right, that's basically right. Uh, B. Can an operator be both Hermitian and unitary? Ooh, good question. Um, I would. My suspicion is no, unless the eigenvalues are one and or negative one. Right? Only a so how do we show that? Um so if we imagine a unitary operator that was also Hermitian, what properties would it have? Well if it were Hermitian it would be at its own adjoint. So equals for you you um, I've been limited to having those eigenvalues uh, Yeah, I would say yes, because uh, is Terry and Hermitian. Okay, yeah. All right, C. Suppose M is a Hermitian operator, so E to the I M is a unitary operator. Okay. Um, 
e to the i m is equal to, uh, if we can go back to our notes where we used to exponentiate, exponentiate an operator, it's the Taylor series. So that is, um, you know, I have to go back and check. I want to say we did that, this operator method. Where did I have exponentiating an operator? Oh, where was it? it here. Um, maybe I can just look up Taylor series because it was yeah I think it's equal to One plus um, oh, where was the t uh, maybe they have it in their notes. Uh, operators and Schrodinger equation, maybe here. I forgot where it was. Dang, where was that? Uh, exponentiating. I just did type that into Google. Exponentiating an operator. Uh, So this is E plus I M minus this is a plus I times I S would be minus. Oh, oh here's the definition. Okay. So we have is equal to sum from n equals zero to infinity of i m n over n factorial. Okay, there we go. Yeah, here we go. So uh, this should be um, one plus i 
guess that's just one, and then we have plus i times i is going to be minus m squared 2 i m 6 minus m to the 4 uh, 24 plus dot dot dot. So that's what we have for the exponent shooting an operator. So we want to show that this is unitary if m is Hermitian. So how can we show that this is unitary? So we'll just have u is equal to e to the i m. Well, that would be u t u is equal to one is equal to e to the i m times e to the negative as a e to the i m with the adjoint of all this. I can't really just put the adjoint up there, can I? So this is going to be um, times, well, this is, what is the adjoint of this? Like, I don't know that I can just put the m hat down there, can I? I feel like it's going to kick back a minus sign somewhere. All right, let's uh, go back to definition of the adjoint is going to be this. So if we have what comes down, That work. Okay, what does it mean to take the complex conjugate of that operator? So let me just try this another way. Um, let's 
So we have one plus, hold on a sec, we have, Uh, what does this turn into? So So if this were unitary, we would actually be able to show this over here that um, adjoining the inverse. Uh, let's do this thing first. So what is that going to change? We're just taking the complex conjugate. What does that add? Um, how does this change things? So the adjoint is going to be applied to G now. So we've got We've got F complex conjugate, and then let's make this into two terms. G but this is going to be over here let's put the DX here uh, the definition of the adjoint as it applied to the G, so we would just take this over. Therefore, e to the i m adjoint is going to be which actually I can move this out over here. And since this is uh, the other one, minus i m bar. And so we want to show u t u is equal to 1 is equal to one plus i m minus Actually, maybe let's not write it out like this. Let's do it as sum of n equals 0, infinity. And we're going to just subtract terms. So we're going to have uh, i for n hat 
m minus i over n hat m bar, but we know from this that from unitarity that m or from hermet hermeticity that m is equal to m bar, which is equal to so we subtract these in each case. Um, except for the first term. So it could be just put one plus n equals one to this, because when it's zero, that's just going to be one is equal to one. Oh boy, uh, I think that that's right. Let's take a look at C. Okay. Since M is Hermitian, I M is anti-Hermitian. So E to the negative I M. Okay. All right. Let's uh, get my pencil here. Let's go for D. D, show that the product of two unitary operators is also unitary. So we have to show this. Um, U A U B That follows just by definition. And this is one, and then these are one. So yeah, okay, that one was easy. Uh, e. Suppose U is a unitary operator and V a state. Show that acting on V with U preserves the norm of V. Hmm. Uh, how do we show this? Um, well, norm of V is equal to V comma let's conjugate V dx. And so we should show U V is equal to X, uh, which um, should be equal to U T U V. The definition of this. This is one. Affected. All right, F. Call our old friend the translate by L operator. Boost by Q, which shifts the expectation value and momentum. Verify that T 
PL and BQ are both unitary operators and demonstrate that. Okay. So, hmm. How would we show that this is unitary without knowing the adjoint of that? So if we have this, then it would be, what would be the? So let's do, oh. Uh, so this is uh, I should run. Um... It's same thing with the boost by Q. I guess we can do that one first. Uh, same idea.
x over h Okay, and then so those things are pretty trivial because you're just shifting it back and forth. I don't know if there's a more complicated analysis here. Ah, uh, I mean, I didn't show it that way, but I don't think that that matters. So let's go on to uh, question two. Quantum evolution is unitary. Two. The time evolution of a quantum state is dictated by the Schrodinger equation, I h bar dt psi of x and t is equal to e hat psi of x and t, where e is the energy operator. The meaning of the Schrodinger equation is this. Given the state psi uh, x at zero, time minus time times zero, and the energy operator, unambiguously determine the state later on. Okay, so this is this time evolution operator, ut psi of x and zero is equal to psi of x and t, okay? Give a physical reason why it must be unitary because probability is to preserve. B. Give a physical reason why ut must satisfy a simple composition law. ut2, ut1 is equal to, okay. Okay, because uh, oh, this is actually a little trickier. Um, So ut goes from t t t. So u One. 
Um, I don't be a physical reason for that, though. I mean, if we involve in time by T1 and then by T2, we better end up at T plus T2 or R is not deterministic, which it is. All right, C. Use the Schrodinger equation to show, oh, show that UT satisfies the operator equation. So we know, okay. Um, Uh, dt is equal to e bar, right? Ooh. Uh, where's our Schrodinger equation as an operator? Where is that? Do I have it on here? So we have I H bar is equal to E at I H bar D D T E at. So Minus R um, This is true of a general wave function. And UT should also be a wave function, so because of unitarity we should have That would also be true at a higher time, so. No. I mean, this should be. B. D. Find the most general solution to this differential equation which satisfies the above two properties. Hmm. So what do we have? We have
So the psi prime is proportional to r at psi what is something that When you take the derivative, you'd get that dropping down. It's going to be e to the something, right? e to the minus U prime, one sec, I'll do it the other way. You had prime T is equal to um, minus H bar. I'll just put IH bar here, IH bar divided by energy operator here, VT. So what do we have? This would be should be right, I think. In principle, we are always solving by simply expansion eating. Minus I. Okay, as uh, what's that? All right, let's look at these. If Milky makes an makes an appearance, I have to make an appearance. Mm. Are you jealous that you're not getting enough screen time while I'm studying? You? I don't think anyone's watching. Okay. Okay. Uh, so I put this here. I think I forgot.
Uh, so why did I get this on the wrong side? So let's just let's just pretend these were f of x of f. This drops down, we get minus i h bar. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. And then this is just, this is just u. T. Okay. I just did it backwards. I gotta be more careful about that. All right, I think that's probably a good place to put a point pause in it for today. So let me just switch over to the so uh, it's been a long day of studying, but uh, we've made good progress. Uh, I've gotten down now to, um, this was, uh, where am I at? My problem set seven, and I just finished, was this the last question? I think this is the last question. No, almost done the last question. Uh, there's two, two, three, uh, four, no, four, five, okay. So we're like kind of 30% uh, of the way through um, question uh, problem set seven. So I'm making progress. Obviously, it's taking a long time. There's a lot of struggle, a lot of work to be done. But I'm hoping that uh, if I keep up this pace for the next few days, I can get down all the problem sets. And then it's just a process of, OK, taking stock of where I'm at, what are all the concepts that were necessary to solve these problems. So I think what I might do is once I've done all the problem sets, go through and make a, like a little list of all the techniques, all the concepts, everything that needed to be known to solve the problem sets. I don't think it's necessarily going to be the case that like memorizing how to solve these problems is going to be very helpful because I'm probably going to get different problems. I'm going to want to be able to solve problems in a different way. But I think the breadth of these problem sets is large enough that if I were to identify all the facts and concepts and ideas that were contained within them, I would have a pretty good base of everything that's to be done. So if I can break that into little components, figure out what things I'm not doing as well, and I, I know that by what mistakes I made in the process. So if there's things that recurringly I was making mistakes on those, then I can have that as being a weakness. I can make this sort of sketch of the whole course, figure out what weak points were what were you know okay i didn't have a problem with that and then i can go through and just practice those parts that were weaker um and then i can either decide to redo some of the problems in the problem set particularly the ones that i got wrong or i can um, decide to tackle additional problems so i think that's how i'm going to do it but the first step is going to be to get through this problem set first pass so that i can go through and actually like analyze where I stand and what needs to be worked on in order to uh, really get a good grasp on this. So it's been a long day. I think I'm going to take a little break. Um, probably had, I don't know how many, I'll have to look at the actual recording to see how many hours it was in total today, but uh, good solid effort. I'm feeling good about this and I'm going to take a little break and I'll be back uh, tomorrow morning, probably around the same time. All right, take care.